Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third session of the World Academy of Arts and Science Mentorship Program. Today's session is inspired by Dr. Michael Marion's topic on tentative big five ideas that youth can and should embrace. Michael Marion is the founder and senior principal of the Security and Sustainability Guide. Uh, his research interests include security and sustainability organizations and their online reports, COVID-19, transformation, assembling policy relevant information, general futures, global politics, and climate change. And Dr. Marion is also the founder of Future Survey, a 24 pager published monthly by World Future Society, where he worked as the editor and wrote more than 20,000 abstracts of future relevant books, reports, and articles. Today as discussants, apart from WAS Junior Fellows, we have Michael Sales, also a founder and the principal of the Security and Sustainability Guide project, as well as the Guide's working group members. We also welcome WAS Fellows, David Harris, uh, Thomas Reuter, and Bob Horn. All who are joining us, joining us today online can leave comments in the chat or the question and answer space on the Zoom platform. Um, now, uh, Dr. Merriam, please take the word and you can, <laughs> you, you, you can start the lecture. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Marta for this uh, unique opportunity to swing through the treetops, which is a non-academic horizontal methodology, <laughs> not in the books anywhere, which contrasts to the careful vertical examining of tree roots, leaves, and occasional tree while ignoring forests and forestry in general. <clears throat> to begin, uh, there are three aspirations of the uh, World Academy Junior Fellows and the uh, Youth Leadership Network that uh, I want to point to. Uh, first is a statement that you seek to transform the outdated way of thinking and action, which is what galvanized my comments today. And also to prepare for a new VUCA world, which is uh, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. I've heard the phrase before in a couple places, I, but uh, it's, it's right on tar target. I agree to it and I will be making several references to it. Uh, also the aspiration by Marco Vitiello is uh, of the Youth Leadership Network. He wants to reunite youth leaders from all over the world, which uh, is a, uh, I don't know about the reunite or unite, but uh, I agree with that aspiration. <clears throat> the five big ideas that follow are overlapping and generic with several sub ideas. Together or singly, they may or may not transform outdated thinking and action in years or in decades ahead. You never know what goes viral, what works. Uh, for example, Black Lives Matter, uh, which suddenly popped up and has uh, at least gone into Europe and is an important uh, slogan. So <clears throat> let's get into it. Big idea one, what is different in the 21st century, which is possibly the last century in human history. For starters, we live in a digital world. China is ascending. New technologies are abundant for better and for worse. Uh, we live with global warming, certainly. Uh, urbanization, COVID-19 and VUCA in general. Uh, First, a note on demographics. The population increase of, uh, is generally expected about 25% by 2050, from 7.8 billion today to 9.9 .9 billion in, in 2050. And COVID-19 so far has scarcely made a dent. With 4 million deaths officially right now, <clears throat> The Economist magazine estimated in May uh, seven to 13 uh, million deaths so far as of May, uh, based on the excess deaths methodology, which is very simply uh, counting the deaths in, 19, in 2020 compared with uh, an average of deaths, uh, deaths over the previous five years, which is one way to get around the undercounting, which is uh, quite prevalent in a number of uh, nations, especially India. 
uh, the, the, of course, this was uh, this estimate was made before the Delta variant began spreading, which uh, may uh, make it even worse. On the other hand, uh, it's interesting. I have yet to see anyone do this to contrast this with the 1918 flu epidemic, which is estimated at 50 million deaths. In contrast to the uh, 50 million deaths at a time when the world population was about a third of what it is now. So if even if we're at uh, 10 or 12 million deaths so far, and even if we're going up to 20, then it's still relatively well off. Uh, not to say that COVID is not very significant and highly disruptive. You should also uh, contrast with the Black Plague in the 14th century, which uh, uh, Lawrence Rice uh, mentions it was estimated uh, roughly at 75 to 200 million dead. So in a sense, we're making progress against uh, global pan pandemics, which is uh, not to dismiss them. Uh, COVID, however, is far from over. And in fact, a recent article in Foreign Affairs in the uh, July issue, uh, page 76, uh, calls it the forever virus. They're quoting, the super variants could bring the world back to square one. The virus will likely ping pong back and forth across the globe for years to come. With major impact, of course, is uh, greater inequality within and between nations as there is struggle between vaccines and variants. The poor get vaccines last because their governments have been last in line to get them, despite the COVAX arrangement, which is greatly underfunded. Also, uh, poor people tend to be more suspicious about governments and or vaccines, and they lack access to where they are um, uh, doing the vaccination. The good news, trying to balance that off, is that as of a couple months ago, again in May, there were 11 vaccines that had been green lighted for use in various countries, 93 vaccines in human trials, around the world, an additional 184 being studied in the lab. So uh, out of all this, the ideal vaccine may yet appear that it's cheap, safe, highly effective against all variants, easy to deliver, and single dose. The question is when, uh, by the end of 2021, uh, very unlikely, uh, by the end of 2022, uh, perhaps, but uh, perhaps even into uh, 2023 or 2024, we've had estimates uh, last year that it would be that long to have adequate vaccination, but things may be speeding up. So again, this is the uncertainty. Uh, COVID aggravates uh, the new VUCA world of uncertainty uh, for certain, and need not elaborate. I'll give one other example of VUCA, just uh, uh, because I think it's a very good example is new technologies for warfare, uh, such as cyber war and cyber attacks, which we have recently uh, seen and are uh, on the upswing. Also consider autonomous offensive systems relying on data that is often incomplete or ambiguous, collected by cheap and deadly uh, artificial intelligence driven drone swarms. So both drones and cyber uh, change the balance of opponents to favor asymmetrical warfare. Maybe uh, David Harris, who's an expert in these areas, uh, might uh, comment on that later. In the 21st century, uh, then in short, there are more existential threats than ever before. And now we have uh, three Bob Horn charts to show. Uh, Marta, can you show the first one on uh, the stability of humanity? There it is. This is done by Bob uh, four years ago, and it's uh, a pretty good uh, one-page uh, summation of uh, various uh, insecurities we now have in the 21st century. Uh, it shows humanity falling off the very uh, top line. Uh, it's not clear whether it's going to be everybody or just a, a lot of people, however. Marta, can you show the second one? How long have we had our mega messes? Okay, this is also from Bob. 
And this is very useful, as you can see, some of these mega messes. Can you pull it over a little bit uh, to the left? Okay, yeah, you can see some of the things in the bottom. We still have the pictures of people here that I guess we can't take off. Any, anyway, you can see that a number of these started uh, decades ago, and the only re recent one is uh, cybercrime and cyber t terrorism, which is the shortest shortest arrow up there. Now let's go to the third one quickly, and then I can I can move on. Yeah, how long will our mega messes continue? Anyway, all these mega messes they have uh, either we, up we, or we, down we, arrows, and we, all of them are down with the uh, exception of poverty, which uh, up to the COVID epidemic, we thought that we were making some headway on it and now it's going, clearly going in the obvious obvious direction. So all of the mega messes are going down, possibly not uh, ozone deple depletion. So, okay, so let's move on to this. Uh, Thomas Reuter uh, wrote in Cadmus in 2017, he said, quote, full acceptance of the facts at this time is enough to inspire fear in any intelligent person and in society as a whole. And my response to that, uh, the problem is assembling all of the facts and threats and getting intelligent people to agree on them and on the remedies and getting adequate political support for action. So that uh, complicates matters. So to summarize for the uh, uh, big idea one, uh, younger generations have every right to be angry about this. They have uh, 50, 60 years of life expectancy based on current lifespan projections, and perhaps more if modern medical miracles are realized. But there's a good chance it could be less. The older folks in charge have perhaps 10 to 20 years of life expectancy, and they're assuming that life will continue to 2100 and beyond. Even the scientists frequently make this assumption. I'm not sure how to break it, but I think that you have to start by recognizing the fair possibility that we won't get there entirely through either collapse or uh, extinction or, uh, or even, even larger. There could be massive, massive catastrophes. And uh, Bob had another uh, uh, estimate of this that he sent to me. Uh, what's, what's the name of the author of that book, Bob? Uh, Toby Ord, Ord wasn't O R D. It? Yeah, O R D. O R D. An estimate of, uh, of various possibilities uh, uh, for existential threats, but he did not consider the uh, the planetary boundaries, which you have down at the bottom of this this first chart. So uh, anyway, uh, to help things along, I think youth needs a widely shared slogan like. Uh, Make America Great Again, which uh, was quite vacuous. But for starters, I'd throw one out, um, grow up, get real. Or perhaps grow up, get uh, VUCA. Okay, big idea number two. Info glut and ignorance. More people, more communications in more ways. Okay, why info glut? It's a greater global population that is more educated and increasingly working in services, which involves providing scholarly or scientific information. Also more NGOs that provide uh, free online reports, which I've recently discovered that this is a whole category that uh, is being neglected. And uh, I, uh, I'm having, hope to have an annual report on reports and the latest Cadmus has my second edition of that. Uh, also, of course, there's uh, social media of various forms, which are complicating things, and ubiquitous photography. So why ignorance? Um, many, many years ago, I started out uh, at the Educational Policy Research Center at Syracuse <coughs> uh, back in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, so that's how long it was, and I happened to publish a speculative scenario in 1971 on emergence of an ignorant society, where learning needs outdistance attainments as change and complexity increase. I put this notion on the shelf for a long time, just forgot about it, no one responded, but recently I began to think, well, we really are getting to be an ignorant society, that this makes sense and maybe, maybe has to be uh, reworked. 
And then at the same time, this is reinforced by two important articles that I very recently discovered by World Academy fellow Zia Sarder, who is a former editor of Futures. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Zia. He has not been active in the World Academy publications, but he's a very prolific uh, uh, a Muslim scholar, among other things, on, uh, on Muslim history and theology, as well as futures. Anyway, he has these two articles I strongly recommend. Uh, the first called The Smog of Ignorance, Knowledge and Wisdom in Post-Normal Times, which is in Futures in May 2020. And also very recently, uh, he published The Nature of Time in Post-Normal Times, which is in the Journal of Future Studies, and uh, volume 25, number 4, 2021. Uh, I think the uh, Junior Journal of Future Studies is online. If uh, you can't get a hold of Futures, then uh, I can send you the PDF that Zia sent, sent to me. But uh, both of his essays are very sophisticated, very much about a VUCA world, which uh, Zia describes as post-normal times. And I, I recommend both of them because they argue convinc convincingly that quote unquote, knowledge is no longer what it used to be. He has his own taxonomy of ignorance that overlaps my own simple and provisional scheme. I won't get into his taxonomy, but I know I just have four kinds of ignorance. The evolutionary ignorance, which was my original premise, where we're unable to keep up with the change that we have created. The second kind is what I call fragmentation in this ignorance that is due to many more people communicating knowledge in many more ways, and even the proposed remedy of multidisciplinarity and synthesis ignores the fact of fragmentation among the synthesizers, uh, which is uh, quite evident in Cadmus, where there is little or no cross-citation. The third kind of uh, ignorance is what I call political ignorance, where you have misinformation and disinformation giving people, i.e. especially voters, what they want to hear with no accountability for truth criminals. Uh, Sartre uh, calls this uh, plain ignorance, the fake news, alternative facts, bullshit, etc. He has a number of synonyms <laughs> for that. Uh, our previous pre president of the U.S. Uh, was, and he still is an example, while still ma maintaining a substantial minority of political support. A fourth category, this may be more problematic, but I call it just distracting industry, uh, uh, ignorance, uh, theater, concert, sports, travel, the recent billionaire space, space race where Richard Branson uh, went up into space for 15 minutes. It uh, got a lot of publicity. Uh, we have abundant film and television that allows escapism from facts, theories, policies. Uh, and, and so forth. Well, much is to be said about arts and sports and, tra uh, and travel, and, but still, in general, if uh, too much of it just distracts from learning about our um, social and economic situation and, uh, and uh, pursuing uh, proper policies, uh, what you might call civic learning, in sum, uh, the emphasis obviously should be on constant learning and unlearning, unlike traditional static societies and cultures where learning needs for fishing, hunting, food preparation, etc., are largely a one and done matter. And uh, we have two anthropologists in the group, uh, uh, Dr. Reuter, as well as uh, Dr. To be Neskovic, or Dr. Almost There Neskovic, and we'll, we'll, we'll see if they, they, they agree with that, that comment. So uh, one other lesson from this is that we should all try to speak and write more briefly and clearly to be heard by others, but this is hard to do. Big idea number three, beyond climate change, biodiversity and planetary boundaries. Uh, this big idea is known by some and relatively easy to understand. Global warming and the growing severity and number of consequences, storms, drought, heat waves, wildfires, sea level rise, are another major difference of 21st century life. Everyone on this Zoom know, knows this. Most people, most societies know all are part of this. Even the deniers are now accepting climate change 
while assuming that it's not man-made but a natural phenomenon, therefore hoping that it may decrease or go away soon. But climate change is so widely known, even if not believed by all, that I suspect eyes glaze over when it is mentioned. Positions seem fixed and little or no progress has been made in recruiting new believers in man-made climate change, despite wide publicity given to the Swedish scold Greta Thunberg. Greta goes to high and mighty places like the World Economic Forum in Davos, says her piece, and attendees can feel that they are adequately woke. But are they? <laughs> the problem of focusing only on climate change is that it ignores the wider environmental crisis and how climate is contributing to these problems and vice versa. A big step in moving out of this box is a recent workshop report called Biodiversity and Climate Change is co-sponsored by IPBES and the far better known IPCC. The IPBES is the Intergovernmental Panel for Biological and Eco Ecological Services. Uh, just now published in uh, June, 28 pages long, states unequivocally that, quote, the mutual reinforcing of climate change and biodiversity loss means that satisfactorily resolving either issue requires consideration of the other. Climate change obviously exacerbates the accelerating decline of bio, uh, biodiversity kind of footnote. A recent conference of leading entomologists refers to an insect apocalypse that's underway. Uh, in turn, ecosystems and their biodiversity play a key role in carbon storage and fluxes in greenhouse, greenhouse gases. Now, if this is still insufficient to uh, appreciate environmental alarm, the planetary boundaries concept of Johann Rockstrom et al. introduced in 2009 goes still further in widening concern. In addition to climate change and biodiversity loss, the seven other planetary boundaries concern the nitrogen and phosphorus uh, cycles caused by overuse of fertilizer, ocean acidity caused by vast fossil fuel emissions, which leads to reduced ocean ability to absorb carbon dioxide, freshwater consumption, agricultural land use, toxic chemical pollution, ozone depletion, and atmospheric aerosol loading. In sum, Climate change must be viewed in a broader context. And this uh, is a report to the Club of Rome that uh, uh, called uh, Bankrupting Nature, Denying Our Planetary Boundaries, came out in uh, 2012. Uh, so Wickman and, and Rockstrom are the authors. Uh, since then, uh, Rockstrom has a uh, more popularized book that was published in English uh, but in Sweden, and I, I had a copy of it, but I, I can't find it anymore, so I can't cite it. So it's, it's kind of difficult to get a handle on the planetary boundaries, but they are there, and I, I think that everybody here know, knows about them anyway. So uh, move on. Big idea number four, encouraging green capitalism in the middle way. Uh, four years ago, Michael Sales, who is uh, here, Michael, there he is. Anyway, we both published a long report in Cadmus entitled Greening Capitalism Quietly, Seven Types of Organizations Driving the Necessary Revolution. This is in the May 2017 issue, uh, pages 150 to 166. The Necessary Revolution refers to a pressing 2008 book by MIT's Peter Senge et al., who Michael knows. Anyway, this lengthy report was the first spinoff from the Security and Sustainability Guide, identified some 150 organizations driving the greening of capitalism, which we grouped in seven categories. One, business-led groups such as the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the World Economic Forum, and the 2016 Business and Sustainable Development Commission. Two, ethics-driven groups such as the UN Global Compact, the Interface Center on Corporate Responsibility, and the Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Leadership, which uh, has 132 on staff. Uh, three, broadened accounting groups led by the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, Measure What Matters, and the International Integrated Reporting Council that encourages business to 
think holistically. And uh, the accounting groups are going to make uh, more progress on th this matter of valuing nature than the economists are, uh, apparently. Uh, four, certifying organizations such as the International Organization for Standards, Social Accountability International, and Organics International for, for Agriculture. There's several dozen of them. Uh, five, green investing organizations such as the Sustainable Stock, uh, Stock Exchanges Inter Initiative, the Global Sustainable Investment Alliance, and Principles for Responsible Investment. Uh, six, green consultants such as the Carbon Disclosure Project, GlobeScan, Natural Step, and Sustainability, which is founded by John Elkington, who originated the triple bottom line concept of people, planet, profit in 1994, so 20, more than 25 years old for that concept. Finally, green business publishers, such as the Business and Sustainable Development Commission, the Green Biz Group, which has annual conferences and green leaf publishing. So transition to green capitalism is a huge and important idea, suggesting a middle way between simplistic free enterprise and big government socialism which the Republicans are constantly uh, 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 tagging on any proposal by, by Biden, un unfairly, of course. But the transition needs updating and shorter spinoffs, such as op-eds, to widen appreciation and further the revolution. Our report is yet to get any dissenting feedback. I mean, nobody says it's wrong, but it haven't had any positive feedback either. So we suspect that it's just too long for anyone in World Academy to consider and needs to be directed to multiple business audiences. Uh, note, calls for transition from profit-oriented economies to human-centered ones are simplistic and self-defeating. Rather, the triple bottom line of people, of people, planet, profits is far more effective as well as embracing ESG factors, are also, which is also environmental, social, governmental, which is also even more popular than PPP. Business needs profits to stay in business, very simply. Excessive profits and outrageous ratios of CEO pay to that of workers, however, both deserve wide criticism. Uh, five, okay, uh, big idea five, collective thinking and action, too much and too little. It took me for a, a while to, to arrive at that subtitle, but it's very important. The big idea of greening capitalism involving some 150 driving organizations leads to the larger notion of collective thinking and action via organizations concerned in some way with security and or sustainability, which is the focus of uh, this the security and sustainability guide and our uh, slogan is uh, uh, you can't have one without the other. That's security opens sustainability and sustainability opens uh, security. The SSG has now recorded some information in more than 2000 organizations accessed through three indexes, a generic categories dashboard, a major categories index with 15 or more listings and a subject index with, uh, with more than 100, 700 listings. Okay, this, uh, what do we have here? I think we have something like 70, 70 categories now and, uh, and some, are, some are even missing, but uh, we had a cutoff of, uh, of uh, 15, 15 or more organizations in each, each of these uh, uh, categories. Uh, notice the, the big one there, alliances, coalitions, and networks. Well, this is still a, a very big mouthful so that the, uh, we also have the generic categories dashboard. Can you put that up now, please? Uh, six, six general categories and 32 subcategories. And uh, you can see, see that there's uh, a, lot, a, lot, a lot to consider here. Uh, just uh, climate change organizations, 100 and 169, and sorting through that is be quite a task. Energy is well over 100. Sustainability, lots of organizations are for sustainability. 
one way or the other. Under governance, we have uh, UN agencies, programs, and projects, uh, 101. I don't think even the UN realizes everything that's going on there. Uh, uh, under groups of people and info, the alliances and coalitions, 190. I'm going to mention that subsequently in case you're an information uh, addict. And we have 83 information portals of organizations offering more information for you. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, under security, uh, peace groups, 110 that are in favor of peace and so forth. That probably overlaps with nu nuclear disarmament. And then very recently, we just added cybersecurity because it's a, a rapidly rising concern and and uh, we're, we're dealing with that. Okay, anyway, back to the text. Uh, a big hypo hypo hypothetical lesson of the Greening Capitalism Report is that it is simply too long. In turn, 2,000 organizations in the Security and Sustainability Guide is much too big of a bundle for anyone except the info obsessed. But the bundle should not be ignored. It is an inconvenient truth to cite the title of a book by Al Gore from a decade or so ago on climate change. And so we are breaking this mega list into smaller chunks and initiating a series of three to four page quick looks on discrete topics, briefly describing leading organizations that address some problem area. Some drafts are already posted. And so far we have eight quick quick looks that are near completion on the Arctic, cybersecurity, environmental peace building, fashion, migration and refugees, plastics pollution, global and regional security, and water. A quick look on human security is just beginning with uh, David and Lorenzo are working together. I hope, and uh, there's also uh, the Youth Leadership Network is beginning to prepare a uh, quick look on youth groups concerned that are concerned one way or the other with security or sustainability, such as Extinction Rebellion, and Ivana and Marta are, are involved, involved in that. Uh, the possibilities are not quite endless, but we could probably produce 50 to 100 of these quick looks, as suggested by the major categories index. This may alleviate uh, security and sustainability in info glut while paradoxically adding a whole new if dimension of information. Similarly, we already have un unanalyzed data on the 186 alliances, coalitions, and networks, many concerned with sustainability, climate change, and or renewable energy. Arguably, there are too many already, yet we probably need more eventually leading to a grand network of networks as Thomas Reuter has proposed. But there's no point to advocating further collective thinking and multidisciplinary reports until we can get a sense of what is now underway. So in summation, some uh, quick advice for junior, junior fellows. Uh, first, uh, transforming Outdated ideas and actions is no easy matter. It may take years or decades and you may not be successful at all. However, in addition to disappointments, you may get lucky. Two, find your niche probably as a specialist in some area, such as a major SNS category, but possibly as a generalist tying things together in overviews. Do what you do best and like to do if you can. You may have a number of jobs and positions before settling down to one or you may keep moving around or get moved by others. Or you can create your own job, which is what I did several decades ago. Three, personal finance is important. You may have well-off parents who can offer support or a relatively well-heeled significant other in your life, a spouse or partner. Deciding whether to raise children is a major concern as regards money and time. Four, heed Quote, advice for artists, which was the title of an op-ed in the, the July 9th uh, New York Times just a week ago, noting that many parents prefer their offspring to become respectable and well-paid doctors or lawyers or marry the same. But for those who want to become artists and writers, try to get parents to tolerate your choice, just go for it and or prepare a backup plan. Saving the world is similar. You probably won't earn much income, but it can be meaningful involvement. 
five, move beyond generalizations such as advocating peace, sustainability, or more action against global warming. Focus on specifics and priorities. Six, core values of the youth leadership ne network are all commendable, open-mindedness, spirit of adventure, taking risk, evolving by trial and error, they should all be followed. Seven, above all, ask good questions. For your information, ask me a question, which is what my mentor was uh, constantly citing. And now it is time for you to ask some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for this overview of crucial problems that have to be addressed uh, when it comes to action for a viable future society. Um, I will make a first comment and then um, we, we will continue um, with, with anyone who, who wants to um, develop the discussion. So it seems to me that the problem with developing uh, sustain with the sustainable development world is firstly ignorance and lack of consciousness. Uh, our minds simply don't naturally lead to a sustainable action. Uh, but even more, we live by mechanisms that are not sustainable and that cannot be changed at a sufficiently um, fast pace. So when it comes to educating and raising consciousness, we come to the question of governance and the relationship between institutions and people. That is the one who are governed. So youth movements can possibly serve as a bridge between the two. Um, I, I going through some youth organizations, um, trying to list them and trying to see uh, how they uh, how they try to approach sustainable development uh, uh, goals and problems. Uh, it seems to be kind of one of the ideas. And now, when it comes to these mechanisms, uh, well, youth have also been nurtured by the same institutions that ought to be transformed. So we're in need of radical change. Are, so are actually, are we need, in need of radical change in terms of abolishment of old institutions and, and building completely new ones with new ideas and new, um, with new understanding? Or, because this seems a little bit too radical <laughs> to me, so what actually, what kind of institutional transformation is possible? Um, but because when, when the discussions, I think that usually when youth, with youth, youth discussions, we try to think kind of out of the box, not trying to transform what already exists slowly and um, slowly and, uh, and, and sustainably, but it, it can sometimes turn to, uh, to sort of a radical approach. So um, that, that's my comment. <laughs> Well, I, I got two questions out of that. Youth is a possible bridge between governance and education. Is that right? Uh, no, it was between uh, government institutions and people in general, the governed, because uh, we try to institutionalize youth groups so that we can have impact on how things actually work uh, in the society. Uh, so, but we also, we also, come from a side where uh, we have to fight fight for um, uh, for having a voice for ourselves. So we're kind of on, on the both sides trying to fit into to make an, to have an, an importance on both sides in the government and in the governed. <laughs> well, uh... Also, as a second question, what kind of institution and trans transformation is preferable? I mean, they're both very broad general questions. And uh, so the second one, uh, you have to find out, find out what works. There are some, uh, uh, there are some books on that, but uh, it's, it's, it's much too big to get into. As far as governance and education, at least in the US, uh, sustainability is not even on the horizon. I mean, right now there's a huge battle about critical race theory in the schools, uh, you know, which is historical. Oh, don't go there. Uh, don't go there. You know, are you, are, you, are you or are you not going to acknowledge that America once had slaves, uh, essentially? And uh, it's, again, it's, uh, it's a large question uh, of um, how do you improve on what, what already exists? I mean, there is some, some activity that already exists, uh, but is it at all adequate? Probably not. Uh, so you have to find out what works best uh, where and, uh, 
and how to get, how to institute it. But it, it, it it's a concern that's well that's well beyond this particular discussion at this time. Uh, Noting that somebody else wants to address it. So I think it's very important for uh, youth especially, but for each one of us to understand that we are just a part of the very big process of the change. And we maybe, as uh, Mike said in the beginning, maybe we will not uh, make some concrete um, uh, task. We will maybe not finish something that we wanted to do, but at least we can contribute to the process uh, if we have the clear vision of and the ideology and the uh, values on, on what we want and what we want to achieve and what we want to, the change we want to uh, make and actually to become. So uh, I think it's just uh, very important to have this very clear base and to have uh, one goal, uh, which is uh, as very precisely um, described is in SDGs, but uh, it can have, I can imagine, it, it should also be communicated in the most simple ways as it is already right now with the symbols that uh, most of the people can understand it. It's only the thing that we have to understand that uh, even sometimes a small contribution to a process can make a change in uh, after us, I mean, in 50 year time and 100 year time. So. That's my comment. Mm -hmm. Michael Fails, you raised your hand. Thank you. Um, well, I've um, been working with uh, uh, Mike uh, for over 20 years. And I just want to touch on uh, the reason why and uh, come back to something he said about the information glut. <clears throat> uh, so what Marion has done that's been attractive to me uh, as a, a generalist in a, a variety of ways, and um, I'm a person who's a generalist in a variety of ways, is that uh, he has tried to uh, uh, get at a description of the world system. And uh, it's ever, uh, it's like uh, trying to run down a butterfly, you know, without a net. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it's impossible to do. And, 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 and the butterflies are, they're, they're amazingly uh, fecund uh, species because they're always, re <laughs> you think you got one and then there, you know, there's another 10 where you, where you were going after the one that you thought you were gonna get. But my, uh, the, the, the power of uh, being someone who's engaged in uh, information management and information management for the public good and information management for not only for the public good for, but for the fulfillment that comes from to oneself by uh, comprehending uh, more and more of uh, the system and being um, uh, someone who accepts that you're never gonna know it all, but you can more and more embody what it is to be uh, a planetary citizen. And uh, I think we're gonna, we're, we're moving quickly uh, to a era where it's, we're not only gonna be planetary citizens, we're gonna be beyond that. And so what, uh, what I like about, uh, and why I've been involved with the SSG for, uh, pretty much from its beginning, is it's this, it's this, this effort to um, try to get uh, our own mind around this uh, enormous uh, and ever expanding system. And by doing so, uh, you one engages in an act of leadership. So it's an act of scholarship that becomes an act of uh, leadership and action through scholarship uh, and through an ability to describe things. So uh, I think that, you know, to, I, I, I'm not sure that Bob would agree with me because I've never, never really interacted with you before, Bob, but, you know, the, the, the notion, the, the existential condition that we're in, to use Marion's term, is one of, um, 
collective thinking and action too much and too little. So that we've got uh, so much information and there's so much incredibly powerful information and useful information, uh, but it's the knowledge of how to manage information is not uh, very widely distributed. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a big opportunity and one that I'm glad that I've been engaged with. I agree with you, Michael. Um, the um, it, 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 knowledge manager has been uh, also a characteristic of my life. Um, and for handling the larger me uh, social messes and wicked problems that we face, um, uh, what I have been engaged in in the last 20 years uh, is the kind of art that you see on my wall behind me which is a, an, a smaller version of an information mural on radioactive waste management, which is a million year problem for humanity. Uh, and the question is, how do you synthesize that information to keep it as an orientating thing so that then an organization in this case, the British agency in charge of nuclear waste disposal put the mural that I made on the wall in its cafeteria. Hmm. So it could keep the, the big picture in mind at all times. The big picture includes both the history of the nuclear era, their current decision-making situation, and their 40,000 year plan, I repeat, their 40,000 year plan. And you have to be able to, to, to at least have some represent, this is the best representation I think that we have as yet, where one person can walk up to one of these. Now, I think that for thinking about any of the problems that Michael uh, Marion described as VUCA or VUCA, um, uh, we need uh, murals like this on all four walls mm. and maybe more. Ceilings too. Actually, if I, if I could uh, comment on that, I've been meaning to say something and actually it's, it's coming out uh, in, in all of what, uh, all of your comments. And um, uh, a famous anthropologist, Gregory Bateson had a, um, an important insight about the, the relationship between mind and nature and more specifically between the territory, which is nature, yeah, and, and the map, the mental maps that we make. And I think uh, the uh, uh, Security and Sustainability Guide is a very good example of that. I mean, you know, pretty be good to reflect on, on the nature of this exercise. It's, it's a map ma making exercise on a fairly abstract level compared to the murals. Uh, that we just heard about, that uh, Bob spoke about, which is more artistic, yeah. But it's all about abstracting or seeing pattern in things. And that's what the mind does. And it's, it's an excellent tool, but it, is, it isn't everything. The territory is not the map. And the, oh, sorry, the map is not the territory. The map is only a simplification. Take the SS, uh, SSG for an example. Here we have thousands of organizations working on sustainability. They've been clustered. Okay, why are we clustering? Because there's too much information. What do you do with 2000 entries? You've got to cluster it. You make hierarchies. That's because of the way the mind is limited. You know, there's a, a we have limited cognitive capacities or we have to simplify. We have to have a taxonomy to make sense of things. Uh, yeah, there's also artistic ways of simplifying uh, the, the, the information. But we, we mustn't forget that there aren't 2,000 organizations working on sustainability. There are millions. There are millions. And it's a bit like the food chain in, in the ocean. You know, you have many, many, many small ones, and they're like the krill in the ocean. And the few big sharks that you see floating around that make a lot of noise and splash about, they're few. And really, the Broad base is, you know, the microorganisms, the tiny 
creatures, you know, in the food chain. And it's the same there. And ultimately, it's all, all the individuals who, in their daily lives, think about, you know, what can I do today to, you know, produce less waste and travel fewer kilometers and so on. So really, there is some, sometimes we have to remind ourselves, uh, you know, that the way things work is not like that. And um, it, I also wanted to talk about the, the initial map about all these precarious situations, okay, stacked on top of each other. And if you think of it logically, you know, if you multiply the probabilities of things going wrong, okay, you'd have to say we have no chance whatsoever, you know. It's so precarious, it cannot work. But I wanted to say that once again, you know, the territory is real life and real life isn't like that. You know, in real life, you look at the human body, for example, it's hundreds of, on hundreds of different dimensions there is homeostasis, balance, precarious balance. And yet it goes on. In fact, life works in this very precarious way all the time. It's absolutely normal. And don't think, you know, a few generations ago, so, you know, when people lived as hunter-gatherers uh, gatherers or peasants or whatever, it wasn't precarious. It was also precarious. It's always been and always will be. That's normal. We shouldn't be too worried about it. And we shouldn't think that it all has to be organized, you know, through conceptual mapping and, and linking up, you know, because the, the connections happen anyway. It's, it's organic, if you know what I mean. People talk, you know, people exchange information constantly in ways that are infinitely complex. So really, we shouldn't, shouldn't be too, you know, too, too ambitious. We, we can help. We can help by making maps, but it, there are limits and uh, we shouldn't put too much pressure on ourselves. And... The same goes with organizing. You know, once you've made a map, you want to organize things. You know, you, <laughs> uh, you organize a tour or something with your map. Okay, you want to get people to move in the same direction together. And, and there I wanted to, before I finish, I want to say that uh, bring, bring up another uh, um, a social science insight from uh, Norbert Elias, who wrote a book called The Process of Civilization drawing on others, Durkheim, Weber, and so on, you know, basic social science, which says that if you look at history, where there's history of, of you know, chemical substances, uh, history of life, history of societies, what you see is a process of increasing specialization, differentiation, and interdependence. Weber called it uh, the division of labor in society, you know, anyway, there's this sort of process of interdependence and the more interdependent we, come, we become, the more we, there is a need to organize at a higher level again and again, you know, from small tribal societies to nation states to global governance. Yeah? Um, and I think you can only push it so far. If the need's not there yet, you can't, you can't make people cooperate, you know, they'll just drop off, you know, if they don't have incentives, they don't have some kind of reward or need you know, for, for cooperating, for, for networking, for getting together on something. They're not going to do it no matter how much you push and, and try and reason with them. So, so somewhere there, I think we are kind of riding this way, you know, we're not. We're not making the wave, we're riding it. And, and uh, you know, that's all we need to do. You know, we, it's like surfing in a way. So the wave is that, okay, you know, the need now for global cooperation is becoming greater and greater, okay? Because um, if you break up the problem of say global warming, it can't be solved. It's got to, be, we have to work together uh, in, in myriad ways, very diverse ways but together somehow, you know, we can't have large sectors of global uh, society, say China or India. India is an interesting case. Um, <laughs> it's going to be the biggest uh, climate change, uh, you know, a, 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 a greenhouse gas producer in the world soon. And what do you say to people there? You know, they, 
They use a lot of coal still. They're in a phase of development. Uh, you know, how, how can they leapfrog? It's very difficult. We can't afford to, to leave big chunks of global society out. So there's the need, and we, we, we're trying to surf that wave and sort of suggest, well, you know, do you realize, you know, you're working on this, there are other people out there who are doing the same thing, and, you know, wouldn't it be good to, to coordinate? So we can only kind of point out uh, uh, sort of um, uh, the, the potential that's already there through this map making. And that's, uh, that's, that's quite significant if that can be done. Whether it is uh, the SSG or whether it's the use the leadership network in different domains, you know, it's only surfing the wave, but it's still quite something to, to, uh, to, to, to use that energy to, to propel uh, some movement forward, you know, some kind of uh, create a cooperation at a higher level. That's all. Well, that <clears throat> that cooperation is important. That is important both at a higher level and on local on on local various local levels. Uh, for example, um, the number one solution, according to the to drawdown. Project Drawdown, which is, I think, the most important sustainability uh, analysis <clears throat> in the last five years, um, uh, has, has uh, identified that refrigeration management is the most important solution for the, glo for the global climate problem. That means air conditioning and refrigeration. Um, and... Uh, <clears throat> they have done, and by the way, they've done both uh, uh, a CO2 uh, analysis and a cost analysis and ranked 80 solutions. So you've got, you know, good enough goals. We, you know, I, I think need we think about not perfect goals anyway, and there's not going to be perfection in any of this. There's got to be good enough goals. And so refrigeration management is one of them. I found uh, a, a young woman, uh, who is the executive director of the North American Sustainable Refrigeration Council in the county north of where I live in San Francisco. And a friend of mine and I said, let's have some coffee with her. Maybe we can help. We did. We've been able to help in a number of ways. Um, uh, and she has, uh, you know, what, what I think has happened is that director, she, her, her, let me just say her task is to get 38,000 supermarkets in America to change all their refrigeration in the next 15 years. That's funding them for at about a million dollars each in order to, to be a, a satisfactory um, climate change situation. So, you know, I'm not gonna do that work. She's doing that work, but she needs help. Um, and I say, well, how can, you know, I'm, I've got a little bit of time, I can help. And uh, I helped with the com some communication problems. She said, we need to talk, we, you know, nobody knows about this. I said, well, I know some journalists, you know? <laughs> you know, do you, have a, do you have a fact sheet? She says, no, well, we don't have a fact sheet. And I said, well, Journalists need a fact sheet because they got to persuade their editors <laughs> that, that they can write the article about it. So make a fact sheet and I'll help you. You know, I'm, I'm a, I'll be edited. Uh, you know, I'm not going to write it. I don't know anything about it, but I'll edit it until I'm satisfied that it'll get to an editor. Uh, so you can help. And also people, uh, uh, young people in, and, 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 and even middle-aged people in these leadership positions um, often I've noticed do not have uh, people they can just talk to who have, who have a good ear and who can listen or can help them out in some way. So there are plenty of things that, that can be done on exactly on local levels. In, in my case, I'm just helping out with the, the 38,000 supermarkets, which are, the, which are the local level here on refrigeration. 
I was going to say that Bob's comment you know, highlights some of the issues there that I was also trying to get at, um, exemplifies them in a way, because I mean, who do you bring together in order to cooperate? You can, do, you can bring together a thousand people who work on sustainability, and maybe they don't have that much to say to each other. And you, you know, because they, you, you, you're bringing together on a conceptual level what is similar. But at the local level, often, you know, what you're doing, you're bringing people together who are very different. And that's what makes it interesting because they have different skills. That's what I was trying to say. Differentiation is powerful because, you know, if you have a society of 10 and everyone's got different skills, that's strong. If they all have the same skills, well, not so strong. Well, Tom, Thomas, the... Uh, uh refrigeration and air conditioning situation is about 10 uh, about 10% mm -hmm. of the of the total climate change solution um, so. and uh, my, I estimate that it's not everybody you know well yes it's everybody who has to buy them but I estimate that somewhere between five and ten thousand people are all that we need to uh, have on board to to uh, solve that that problem because it is mainly has to do with uh, changing the uh, um, design and production of uh, air conditioning and refrigeration equipment. Now, those decisions then turn out to be made by, mm, you know, not probably not more than a thousand to two thousand people in the world. And so then we can say, well, we can start with some of them. And uh, my lovely uh, executive director up here has gotten uh, some of the big companies in the United States to start saying, okay, we'll, we're going to address those, those problems. And we're going to get, since we have, you know, Walmarts and those kind of, who have other kinds of issues, but have the financing to change the refrigeration and also be, have the leadership flag to wave uh, that they're that they're doing that, which we which can move a whole industry. So there are ways to do these kinds of things. If you if you think, and you don't have to think that all 7.9 billion people have to know about refrigeration management in order for us to work on ten, you know, solve 10 percent of the climate change problem. Exactly. Uh, we have a comment uh, that came from uh, Dr. levy Leonard, which was prior to the session, but I promised to read it. So um, he says, engaging higher education uh, in the implementation of Agenda 2030 by teaching the next generation of decision makers to think critically and ethically and in systems and with a focus on, on Agenda 2030. So uh, I don't know, but uh, I can say that uh, when we, uh, well, my generation, at least I think that when it comes to new gener generation is the same as well. We don't have any kind of, um, how do you say, um, primary school, secondary school, um, and not university either. We don't have any kind of education towards what's good for the society, what's good for the planet, what's sustainable, what's not. I think m most of the people don't even know what sustainable means. I mean, when w even through their higher education, if they're not interested in that particularly. So w I think that education here also is, um, it should um, encompass um, kind of the, the most important uh, world problems. We learn about geography, but we don't learn about nature. <laughs> you know? We learn about the history, we, do, we don't learn about ethics. Yeah, yeah well, I, thank you very much for, for all these interesting comments. Um, I just want to add something to what you were just now saying, uh, Marta, regarding education, because of course, if we want to understand reality, we need to have the right instruments to understand what's surrounding us to understand what is happening and for sure education plays a key role in this sense and for sure education is part of the problem that we're facing today because um, as you said Marta many times um, yeah, education does not give us the right skill sets to understand reality which is so 
uh, volatile, uncertain. Um, it's we live in this VUCA a world, which is basically um, very difficult to understand, and it's very difficult to make predictions for the future. And in this sense, education has this immense task to prepare those citizens for the future without knowing what will happen uh, in the future. We don't know what will happen even in one year. Nobody predicted this, um, this pandemic, or at least some were thinking that someday it might happen. But you can never predict now uh, because the reality is so complicated. So many things are intertwined. And this is, of course, a very big challenge for education to try to adapt and teach to future citizens, to children, that it's important not to, um, that, that, well, that, it is, that it's important to be able to adapt to situations as we are uh, living in a much more complex reality than, than in the past. So, um, yeah, um, for sure, it's uh, it's again um, a big challenge uh, to to work on on how we can together um, adapt education to to the world we're living in. But um, I mean, as you all said, there are plenty of ideas, plenty of people who uh, will collaborate on specific issues and on general issues. And it's it really important in this sense to have this kind of diversity, these kind of different experiences um, to enrich the discussions, to enrich the studies. And academia has the, uh, the important role to do all the research, provide the data that we can uh, then digest and maybe understand the, the world we're living in, or at least try to, over. Um, after uh, listening all your insightful comments, I think that maybe we, we are being like uh, too hard with the, with the youth. I think that for the amount of problems that we have currently in the world, we are doing just fine. I mean, we are working towards a change of mindset. And even though our education, it's not the best. And I can surely talk to you about that in, you know, as a Venezuelan. <laughs> um, and because sometimes in different regions or problems get reduced to things that are, you know, political freedoms, the opportunity to live with uh, basic human rights and so on and so forth. The thing is that maybe we should focus not only on sustainability regarding to the criteria that we understand in the parts of the world in which that's a priority but to recognize that in countries in Africa, in the Southeast Asia, in Middle East, even in the Balkans, the things are strictly related with development, governance, human rights, political freedom, uh, social and economic rights, and so on and so forth. So even though we have all this amount of huge problems in basically all the, the, the whole world, I think that the the we're just doing fine. Young people, it's doing their best as they can, at least the, the young people that it's really engaged. And if the teachings of Bruce, one of the Mesquita taught me something, is that you, you don't need the whole population to work on something. You just need this critical mass that can create and activate change. So maybe we just don't need the whole young people working on it. Maybe just we just need that 10 or 20% to create a significant change you know it's like this uh, business law regarding uh 20 percent uh, 80 percent of the problems are solved with 20 percent of effort so uh, being a little bit more optimistic i think that if we don't have a full school war in the next 20 years between china and the u.s that's american responsibility <laughs> if that happens because they are voting. That's with Michael. 
um, I think that um, w we will achieve some of the SDGs goals and not, not others. The developing countries are not the ones that should be leading the way, are the developed countries, the ones that have the full scale responsibility of making everyone in, uh, to follow the same line because the developing country doesn't, we, we don't have the resources, we don't have the political stability, we don't have the civic education for taking that role. And a few countries in the world like Brazil and Japan and Canada that, I mean, they are developing countries, but they are not leading countries. Sorry, they are developed countries, but they are not leading countries such as the US or other NATO countries are trying to make that shift to make multilateralism work. So at the end of the day, we should focus our attention to keep the developed countries working step by step what it's not working and that change will be natural, it's generational and trying to fix the developing countries. We have like only 20 or 30 countries according to the Economist Intelligence Unit that are currently working like full scale democracies and with a uh, I don't know, a healthy economic system. So once we finish with all the developing countries that are tearing apart themselves, maybe we can start thinking about multilateralism work as we imagine that should in the next 30 or 40 years. But I think that's the approach that we should seek. And not be so, you know, like hard with us. We are doing our best. I can I can only agree, Lorenzo. That's a, a, a completely. Uh, I like what you're saying, and it's very true. And uh, there, there is there's no need to sort of beat ourselves up too much. We're doing all right, and there is this function, and it's also normal. Every every living organism is to some degree dysfunctional, but it doesn't matter. A little bit of dysfunction is is tolerable, and if it's too much. If you have countries, for example, under COVID that, that are highly dysfunctional, corrupt, poor leadership, emotive leadership that's not rational, that doesn't listen to science, all these kinds of, you know, where corporations don't pay enough taxes, where wages don't, uh, you know, rise or don't have a reasonable proportion of, of, of a share of the productivity, all these kinds of basic dysfunctions they show, you know, when the pressure arises for one reason or another, they show and they, these systems just won't survive. They, they disintegrate. You have a loss of cooperation, loss of civilization. You go downhill and really the societies that are uh, more functional will prevail, clearly. And which ones those are we, remains to be seen. Uh, um, while I was looking at these different youth, orga youth organizations, and I was, I thought that I'm going to run into this huge number of organizations that have particular goals that, um, or actions that have something to do with sustainability. Uh, but actually, what I came across mostly uh, was youth organizations trying to give, uh, to fight for their own voice, try to empower themselves. But for what? That's also the thing. It's in most of the the organization's descriptions, the um, empowering for something for for something very general, very vast, without any sort of planning or concrete idea what they're actually going to do when they get empowered. Um, so that was a disappointing for me because it's just kind of another way to fight for some kind of part in the. Um, of social power or or governance and it, it doesn't uh, I don't know it just doesn't make sense because now it's become popular to fight for sustainability and how many of, of those organizations that that um, that that exist 
uh, in those terms actually are committed to to doing what they do what they what they what they present themselves to do so um this was just a little bit surprising to me so I wanted to share, share that with you i thought it i thought it was a little different some of you know that my life is tied up with uh, something called strategic foresight and that most of my life has been involved in uh, security issues writ large. Uh, I guess after listening today, I'll, I'll say I'm hugely conflicted, hugely conflicted as, as a person, as a professional, as a, as a member of humanity. Uh, I'm a little conflicted because we've been very Western today. Uh, secondly, I'd like to make the recommendation that we do what we've done today more often uh, because not one of the discussions we started today uh, are really past the preface. And for sure, uh, I long ago uh, in a war far from Canada uh, gave up totally on this difference between um, elders and youth, or educated and uneducated. And my country right now is in a terrible state of affairs, terrible state of affairs on nine wicked problems. But one of the most telling for what we've been discussing today has to do with um, uh, knowledge and education. Uh, I think education's in a terrible state. Uh, I wish there was more credibility and validity for experiential knowledge. And in terms of the massive failures we've had in this country, because we did not listen to, I, I use the word listen very, very kindly here, to our forebears in Canada, the indigenous people. And we are now starting, just starting to pay the price. Uh, people say Canada is a developed country. Frankly, it's an undeveloping country, undeveloping. Uh, I suggest the U.S. is exactly the same. Infrastructure, processes, uh, cultural relationships uh, might have been good a while ago, <laughs> but they are not good anymore. They are not no good. Wrong word, wrong word. Difficult quickly to talk about really complex things like this. It's not appropriate anymore. Uh, just while we were discussing earlier, I picked up the Charter of the United Nations and Statute of the International Court of Justice. And if any of you have this little document, I suggest for a little sort of wake up call about all we're discussing, just read the first page and then try to take that to today, to our world today. I'm not being negative, but I'm not being positive. I'm being realistic. And I finish maybe with the comment, uh, I, I'm really, really pleased to hear we haven't heard the word integration today. <laughs> that word scares the hell out of me. We have heard the word interdependence and that's fine as far as it goes, but there's a lot of people places, organizations, regions, cultures that don't want to be interdependent. And therefore I have fought for years for the concept of interoperability. You don't want to join, you don't have to join. You want to connect, communicate, collaborate, do it interoperability. The very best are able to be the very best. The people that are not the very best are still able to participate without being done for the fact they are as educated, as trained, as rich, as developed. Thank you. Anyway, thank you very much, firstly, Mike, and then everybody else for, for their contribution.